Welcome to the Voices of Manufacturing with your hosts, Brian Salee and Michael Mullenberg, where business leaders across the industry share their unique challenges and insights. It's almost like magic because it takes the learning process sometimes from weeks down to days, sometimes hours. We want to help people within manufacturing and make them excited to come to work every day and go home safe to their family. When you bring people in, they're anything but a machine. They're partners uh, that can help you build your business, that can be your success if you treat them right. And then you start having employees saying, when are you doing my machine? When are you going to come over here to my department? And now you get this buy-in. This podcast is brought to you by Dazuki, the premier frontline digital transformation solution that allows manufacturers to standardize operations. Joining us today is Miles Free from Precision Machine Products Association. Miles, welcome to the show. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, welcome, well, Miles. It's we're, great we're, to be here. We're, we're excited to dig in because precision machining is such a integral part to the ma manufacturing supply chain. And I know you've been involved in the industry for a long time. Do you mind giving us a little bit about your background, how you got into the industry and what you do for PMPA? Sure. So I'm a director of, of industry affairs for PMPA. And uh, prior to that, I'd been director of industry technology and uh, I started in the steel industry in 1973 shoveling iron ore spillet while I put myself through the university and I stayed in, in the steel industry because the wages were so good in manufacturing what I could get as a salary chemist didn't compare to what I could get as a laborer in the steel industry. I didn't remain a laborer long. I became a lab supervisor and uh, ended up quality manager, changed companies a couple times and uh, managed the uh, quality function for what, what what is now Republic Steel's bar division. And then I joined PMPA in 2003. We took a study mission of our members to China and I saw that there was a way we could help our manufacturers stay relevant because we have different standards, different rule of law. And so I helped our members pivot to really high quality, critical, can't fail applications and leave the stuff that if it breaks, it's okay, you can run down and buy another one to the people with the cheaper labor costs. Let's talk about that for a second. PMPA, you mind giving us a little bit of background on what, what the organization does and, and who your members are? Sure. So we're the Precision Machine Products Association. We have about 440 member companies, both suppliers to the industry and precision machining shops. Our next code is 332721 Precision Turn Products. And the parts that we make are essential. We were named essential during the COVID crisis, essential medical infrastructure manufacturers. The 100,000, 150,000 ventilators Homeland Security needed to source, we made the parts for the GM ventilators. We got those prints on a Friday. We had a quote to Mary Barra for about 39 parts, different, different components. Uh, by Sunday, our engineers worked over the weekend. Oh, it's very cool. And I, I know, you know, before we get too far into this conversation, you know, what is precision machining? I think that's, uh, you know, uh, some of our guests will are, are in the industry and understand it really well, but we also got folks who, you know, haven't really been around machining. Well, the way I like to help people understand it is if you take a sheet of paper, just a sheet of copy paper, this is three thousandths of an inch thick. So. Imagine slicing this into 15 more sheets the hard way. That would be two ten thousandths of an inch, 15 to ten thousandths of an inch slices. That's an achievable tolerance for many can't fail critical parts. So people tend to think of precision being very small, but in fact, it can be very precise over a larger a larger part, like a landing gear, 
or a motor shaft where we need to have critical, I mean, you can't be off by two ten thousandths on the location of holes, right? So, uh, or the finish, because it's got to fit exactly right into a journal or bearing. So precision, it, it also implies uh, a level of quality. I don't want non-precision parts going into the soda fountain dispenser or the coffee maker, right? So it's got to be the right material, the right chemistry, right specification, and the right tolerances that gives you the right fit, form, finish. So the function can't fail and people have the quality of life that we do. Yeah. Miles, what is, the, what is the range of materials that we're talking about? I mean, it, it, obviously we, we automatically think metals, but I assume it's polymer, um, composites, all kinds of different metals and, and other materials. A lot of metals, uh, in the, in the past, the last century jobs were primarily steels, alloy steels, and those steels might've had free machining additives like lead or sulfur to promote manufacturability and good finish. Today, with the electrification of automotive and literally everything else that we do, we're running into different materials. A lot of aluminum is used on the new electric vehicles for its ability to take heat away from battery packs. We're seeing different aluminums, a lot of stainless steels, medical parts I call implants the jewelry you wear inside our our shops are making that that's that's relatively important to have precision as as well as the right material so stainless steels really high alloys i was talking with a gentleman today about greek hastaloy they use this stuff in mining under the sea it's pretty much indestructible and it doesn't change over a real wide range of temperature so um don't want to machine that, but we, we have shops that do. Miles, that really leads us into this the next question, which is what are the primary industries that your member companies are, are serving? It sounds obviously aerospace, I'd imagine is, is one of the top ones. What else? A aerospace is a, a large market that we serve. Automotive really is the bread and butter. We, we think about, uh, automotive. So if you think about an internal combustion engine. Uh, almost all the parts in the engine itself are precision machine. Think of the gears and bushings and spacers and valves and, and modulators and stuff in the transmission again, need to be machined. You know, if it, if it drives, if it flies, if it, if it's implanted into a human body, if it's used in medical lab equipment, a precision tool was employed by a precision machinist so that it will actually function and not just be a sculpture. So automotive, aerospace, and aerospace isn't just airplanes, you know, Starlink, SpaceX, yes. you, you, you know, we're there. But uh, a medical, off-road, heavy truck, I mean, there's, there's a lot of mass. There's a lot of parts count. And I'd, I'd like to explain just what that is. That's... 2,345 billion dollars is what manufacturing in the United States is. 2,345, now add nine zeros, and that's what manufacturing is. And manufacturing is the fourth largest, fourth largest segment of our economy. So precision machining, our 332721, it's a subset of manufacturing. We fall under fabricated metals, 332. That's manufacturing itself is 8.6% of uh, the U.S. workforce. So there's a lot of jobs as well. We talked about reshoring a little bit in some of our previous episodes. We've had a million jobs reshored to the U.S. over the last decade. A lot of machining has been done over in China because of short lead times, low cost of labor. But now we're seeing this reshoring effort and it, there's industries, right? You talked already about aerospace, right? And then a lot yeah. of these space companies that are, we've got all these new space companies, which is really exciting and they need precision machine parts. Where's a lot of the growth coming from? You've got reshoring, but then what are the industries that are growing the most right now that you guys are serving? 
I would say it's pretty much across the board. So I've had inquiries from people they're bringing home, you know, bringing back to, I call it nearshoring because chances are it's going to be assembled in Mexico. But kitchen appliances, light appliances, the premium blenders, the premium coffee machines, that's the kind of thing we've seen. But that magical near lead time and cheap price from far away disappears when there's ships stacked up 20, 20 plus outside the port and nobody to unload them. Absolutely. And, you know, I think I saw some numbers, I think you might've shared these with me, the precision machining went from 8 billion to, to 19 billion from 2000 to 2017. So doubled. That's, in- that's, that's true. And from 20, 20- 17, uh, 2017 till now, we're at 20.9 it, in sales, 20.9 billion. So there's your growth. I'm curious, do you anticipate this growth to continue as more and more companies are nearshoring, reshoring? What is needed to fuel that growth, the continued growth as well, or to support it? The real driver is the consumer. And as long as consumers aspire, to have nice things. They want to have things that make them go, gee whiz. They want to have things they put in their pocket that connect them to everyone in the world, everywhere effortlessly. We're going to continue to see growth in manufacturing because we make the components that make the magic happen. Everything else is a sculpture without a precision machine part to give it the fit function, to give it the fit, so that it works and it does something more than just sit there. So it sounds like consumer demand for, for new products is really going to continue to propel the industry here in the, the U S it sounds like. Well, I, I mean, ask that must fella, you know, who, who'd have thought we'd need so many electric battery powered cars. I mean, come on, what a joke, right? Every real men have muscle cars. Real cars burn gas. <laughs> right. right. I was on, on the road yesterday. We didn't get out of Cincinnati and we'd counted 10 Teslas. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Out, out here on the West coast, they're, they're everywhere. I think. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But, but that's a good point. I think, you know, consumer, what consumers want, the consumer habits are, are changing slightly. These are new products that haven't been manufactured previously. And so the, we're seeing like with Tesla, right? They've got a really tight vertically integrated supply chain where they're doing a lot of their built, create, manufacturing a lot of their own parts, or they have suppliers within a, a very close radius to where they're very assembling agile. these vehicles. It very it's agile. A, that seems, is that also something that is propelling the growth of precision machining companies as well as more and more companies are starting to say, Hey, we're going to tighten up our supply chain and we want to have our suppliers within a certain area. What do you see in there? We're actually, uh, outside many of those verticals. So okay, there's part the vertical can't make. So the vertical can get the part to plus or minus double O two when it's plus nothing minus triple O two, they're going to call a shop like us. So it's for a lot of those parts there. They don't need quite the precision that a lot of the other right, industry. Right. And so our shops are really good at working with their customers, uh, call it value, value add, value engineer, design for manufacturer ability. So that do you really need it to be at minus triple O two? If you can open that up this much, here's what happens to cycle time. Here's what happens. We still have the same finish and. We use less power, less carbon footprint. You know, there, there's contract reviews, very important. And the verticals are very agile because they work right next to each other. But there's a lot of institutional knowledge in the specialists in our industry that can really put the finest point on what's needed for that application. Miles, I'd like to understand, we've talked a little bit about the industries you guys serve. There's been tremendous amount of growth in the industry, but every machine shop I talk to, one of the biggest challenges they have is, hey, what's limiting our growth is we just don't have the machinists. We're having to 
bring people in, train them, get them the skills. And that takes a long time. So they don't have a pipeline of candidates that have the skills that they need. And how are some of your member companies deal with that challenge? I mean, it's, it's widespread throughout manufacturing, but precision machining, the skill level is even more important, I would say. Well, the skill level is more important. And at the same time, if you have a discipline in your shop to have documented processes, standard work, and uh, a program, you don't, we still need people with skills and attention and critical thinking, but every decision to make a part shouldn't be a decision or a judgment. It should be the result of a process. So there's no variability. So we have a consistent, no waste product. So the shops in our industry, in our association, uh, that realize they are local, they're part of a community, they work with high schools. And it's important to get out there in high schools and junior highs. They have student apprenticeships, student intern internships. They're reaching out. They're bringing in elected officials. They're bringing in counselors. They're bringing in parents. And I mean, I was just in a shop a little while ago. It was like pharmaceutical quality. You could have a picnic on the floor. I mean, <laughs> polished concrete, shining light, brilliant light, very clean, no FOD laying around, no FUD laying around. It's different. So if you have an active outreach program into the community, if you're working with people, and if you have a very desirable career path, and we do in our shop, I mean, we did not lay any people off. In 2008, the recession of in eight and nine, we actually had, we had shops that were still advertising for help wanted in the great recession. We were making ventilator parts. We were identified as critical infrastructure, medical infrastructure. And we were working on making parts during April, May, June of 2020 COVID. Miles, tell us about that career path. When you reach out to somebody young, give them a shop tour and, you know, they get to see how it actually works, but then go beyond that. And you know, what does that career path look like in, in the industry? Obviously we need talent on the machine, supervising machine, programming the machine, setting up the machine, you know, monitoring the machine, taking parts off, doing quality checks. But, uh, like you would never hire me to operate a machine. I have no gross motor skills and absolutely no fine motor skills. Nevertheless, in the quality department, you know, we have equipment. I can do the math. I can do the trig for location. So I can add value in a quality department, doing calculations that assure that the process is in fact operating at a parts per million level for, for imperfections or not. So you can go from production into quality. We talk about supply chains. Supply chains, you don't just go out the door and yank on the supply chain, right? Someone, the supply chain is this construct in our purchasing agents' heads. And our purchasing agents say, I know this company has the best lead time or availability on this material. This company is my go-to for this metalworking fluid. This is the company I want to talk to for software and services. And so understanding the industry, getting a broader, broader understanding of that, you can get into procurement and then you can get into planning and scheduling. Some people are really good with calendars. You know, I was off by half an hour on our appointment today. Okay. That's just, I'm not calendar boy, but there are people that live and die by, you know, 30 second increments. They're great in purchasing. They're great in production planning. And finally, a, a machinist who's actually had to do the setup, actually had to hold that plus or minus two tenths or three tenths or even five tenths or, or a thousand. Uh, he knows when he goes to a customer in a sales position, whether it's a sales engineer or as a salesman, if he chooses to go that, that path, he's going to add a, he's going to eliminate a lot of frustration because the engineers at the customer just thought they needed that. He knows the pain and the cost that's going to create. So he can head off a lot of trouble in that. So we absolutely need all, we have all kinds of positions and, um, 
you know, you start in operations, you learn your craft, and then you apply your experience and your wisdom. There's a lot of ways to add value, whether it's scheduling, production, engineering, sales. I, it's then you own the company. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it sounds like for a lot of your member companies, then bringing in someone who has the desire, they want to be in the industry. They, they've seen the opportunity that being a machinist creates from a career standpoint and an earning standpoint, and then getting them into the industry and training them. It starts with kind of just layering on different skill sets. Where would someone start initially? in a plant that's doing precision machining? Are they picking material for a machinist? What's kind of the traditional growth path there? Well, I don't think there is a tradition. We've got 10,000 baby boomers lose, leaving the workforce every flipping day. Right? Yeah. So um, it's not a tradition. It's, we've, we've got a great need. And I would say that we don't even want to start with the candidate themselves. We really want to have a conversation with their parents. This is why I said outreach and getting to the schools and the, and the parents having open houses is so important. The average PMPA wage, hourly hourly wage, annually last year for all op occupations. So I took every occupation that our PMPA shops have that's a shop occupation, averaged those hourly rates, and it came out to $21.53 an hour. Okay, so yes, that's average. That's not starting. That's average. It's going up. It's going up because we're not starting people at $9 anymore, right? The world has changed. But here's my question to you. What do you think the real median personal income in the U.S. was at that, at that same in 2019? Probably $10. The real median personal income in 2019 was $35,977. That's $17.30 an hour. You'll be at the real median personal income in one or two years in our career path just starting out. Now, if you get skills and learn to do two and three axes set up, if you learn to be set up programmer, that 44,000 number becomes 47,000 for the setup operator and a setup programmer, 59,952. And you can get there in a few, a couple of years, right? It's a fast. Ab absolutely. And by the way, you know, you're going to go to community college. You won't be in community college a year and you'll have a job because to good students, the employers, there's a pipeline. Hey, this guy's really good. They get a job. The employer starts helping out with the community college fees and tuition. You got a job. You got the shift you need so you can get the classes. Now you've got the skills you need. You've got the AutoCAD. You've got the setup. And next thing you know, you know, you've arrived. You're helping the next guy or yeah. gal, you know, yeah. come operate. It's a great career path for folks who want to get into manufacturing. And I think it always goes back to the challenge we have with manufacturing is the perception and we need to do a better job marketing these opportunities, of course. And I'm curious, you mentioned PMPA uh, member companies, you know, there's a lot of local outreach to the communities they're within. Is there anything PMPA is doing though? That's broader, maybe more, more regional. I know a lot of your members are located in the Midwest. So we cluster what we what we do is we try to provide the information and, and networking so they can be effective. So it's not, we, we can't go in and, and, and bring them candidates, but we can give them, you know, comparisons to compare our industry wages to U.S. real median wage. We can give them uh, poster support because the local vocational schools, they don't have posters about machining as a craft. They don't have posters about becoming a journeyman electrician or mechatronics or, or, you know, hydraulics. They have posters from the U S air force. You know, you don't, industries yeah. don't do that. So we provide that kind of collateral support. We provide them with, uh, facts and data and, uh, 
We'll support them if they have an event. I went up to Wisconsin, student internships, um, went there. They inducted four student apprentices. I loved it. Yeah. That's apprenticeship programs are a great way to, to get folks into the, into the industry. Well, I, I want to transition now and you already talked about the baby boomers retiring and I'm right. curious where, where's this industry headed with the amount of turnover we have with baby boomers retiring, especially knowing that a lot of these businesses are small businesses, less than 50 employees. It's potentially a family business. They might hand it down to their kids, but maybe their kids don't want to run it. Where, where where's the precision machining industry headed? Well, the shops that are thriving have a process for documenting standard work. They declare, this is how we're going to do it. We've got all this talent. We're going to settle on the best way. And once we settle on the best way, we create a process. We lock it in so that we don't get unexpected variation. And because we can do that, the people need less cognitive teaching and it's more about training and understanding the standard work. That's really important. If we have standard work, we have standard processes, we get standard outputs, we get minimal variance, everybody's happy. So the shops that allowed their craftspeople to own the knowledge and keep the knowledge, that's their individual secret. That's not tribal knowledge. And it's certainly not institutional knowledge. So the smart shops, the savvy shops are documenting, creating standard work processes. And then those standard work processes, when you understand them, not every step of that is high value. It's not human worthy. Some of it's just moving from here to here, here to here. Well, a cobot could do that. And now the person with more cognitive ability and talent can be operating at a higher use, doing something that does require human judgment, eyesight coordination or whatever. So uh, it, we've really gone from being obsessed with cycle times, how many seconds to make the part, to becoming more human centered about what's, what's the highest and best way to use our people, use the talent we have, because there's not a big wave of talent coming in. So the talent that comes in, how can we make them most effective, most satisfied? And that's by taking the fear out. And there's no fear. If I follow your standard work and it works, I'm not worried about getting a scold or a ticket or, you know, something in my file. So it's really about understanding our human. Well, the buzzword is industry 4.0 and automation and robots and cobots. And you just hit on a key point without that standard work foundation and without really the people centric model, you can be all over the place on that. So the ones that are doing well have that foundation. It's funny, your comment about standard work. I see that outside, outside the automotive industry, it's very common that that's the gap. It's probably not just, you know, machining. It's a lot of operations and. Um, are you guys um, collaborating on developing those standards or encouraging, you know, companies to aspire to a higher standard of standard work? Well, uh, we do. I uh, was teaching in an MBA program. I, I taught a class on quality and performance management. And, and that was the midterm project is we're going to do standard work at your, at your enterprise for whatever it is. We have two annual meetings, one aimed at managerial level called our update, management update meeting. And then we have a national technical conference and that's engineering and operating and, and owners attend both. And we almost always have something on standard work, um, quality, you know, improving quality. And currently, again, once you achieve reliable standard work, now you are Operator agnostic. I don't have to have my most senior guy on the machine to run this part, right? Well, then I don't need to have my most reliable gal on it either. And I don't even have to have a person there. So now we can, with standard work and robust processes, 
we can now run lightly attended, we have a person to on fire watch, we have a person to stock up, we have a person to do spot audits, about verification that yes, the dr drill's still there, this is still going on, and and everything's running fine. But it's no longer requires human intervention. So if you don't want to work the third shift, if you've got standard work, the machines can work third shift and the crew doesn't have. It. So that's the real payoff because now you're getting more operating hours from your existing resources. Miles, I'm curious, you know, given the companies that you, that are members of your association, again, most of them are under 50 employees. From what I've seen, that's the type of manufacturers, the size of manufacturers that really struggle with standard work because they're in this cycle of we're always firefighting. And so we don't have time to create the standard work because we're always fixing problems. And so how have you seen companies kind of get out of that trap where they just don't think they have the time or the resources because they have, they're so limited. I think that standard work, our shops are often high mix and high volume. And also they can be uh, high mix and low volume. So a lot of SKUs. So I may not standardize on a particular drill, but I may standardize on doing the presets outside the machine. So I don't lose 20 minutes trying to dial it in and getting my, this is my two tenths hammer and this is my one thousandth hammer to get it you know, position just right. So basically, track review, knowing what your shop's capabilities are becomes the first step. So if you're just taking any quote that they award to you, you know, that's, that's a really bad proposition because you don't have the knowledge and 50% of the time you're going to lose money because you didn't anticipate this. On the other hand, if you know statistical capability, I can hold 99.72% of the time, I can hold this range, okay? And by the way, if now if I get a more expensive tool, if I get a more precise tool holder, if I upgrade my collets or my whatever my system is, now I can even reduce that variation. Now I'm not gonna have unexpected waste and I'm gonna be well on my way to making a profit. Yeah, that's a very practical way to get started on it anyway. Yeah, start with those fundamentals. Is See, Miles, are there are there applications for, you know, data science and digital twins and, you know, that whole realm in machining as well? Have you seen any of that? So I haven't. You could accuse me of being at least old order Amish on uh, on a lot of that stuff. Uh, we subtract, we, we add value by subtracting material. You know, it's, uh, it's a, it's a little different approach. Um, uh, I, I just wish that more people would do the kind of capability studies, the SPC to understand that they can, in fact, achieve this finish, that they can, in fact, hold this tight of tolerance rather than go ask some gray haired baby boomer like myself, Hey, do you think we can hold this plus or minus? Well, what's the material? Well, it's this. Yeah, but are we getting it from supplier A or supplier B? That's the kind of stuff that needs to be in standard work. And contract review is where that comes up. That's where you learn that, you know, when you, after the job's costed and shipped and you say, holy cow, we had a lot of downtime. Well, we got this material from mill B. You know, well, so-and-so, we couldn't get the drills we needed, so we just used these and it. So that's where okay. institutional learning takes place. Yeah. Well, but if you're not, if you're not doing it. Yeah. Between you and me, SPC is data science. They've just rebranded it. So I'm, I'm glad you used that example. I, I mean, so the sales department's always, Mr. Free, can you, you know, can we take this order? And it's half tolerant. I had, I had an order once for for we were supposed to draw the hex bar, hex steel, 8650, and was going to be just bent and sheared into, into Allen wrenches. But there's a military spec, and the spec was half tolerance, 
for this high carbon heat treated material. So I'm expecting I need my process needs five thousands. Well, you know, they wanted the the mill spec was like two thousand. So how do you do? Well, I first thing I did was we did a gauge R and R study and found out that no human being with a mic in his hand was even reliable enough to measure compliance. <laughs> you know, hello, you don't, you don't, I don't need industry 4.0 to tell me that, you know, I, I can't measure that repeatably. My micrometer, I mean, there's a gentle curve in this because it's drawn out of a cork. There's a gentle curve. You know, how reproducible am I on hitting these flats so flat? Well, Miles, as we come to a close here, what are you most excited about for the precision machining industry and where it's headed? What are you most optimistic about? You know, I, I'm, I'm really optimistic about the fact that nobody had to tell us to start accepting orders from Tesla. Nobody told us, hey, SpaceX is going to put NASA, make NASA look silly with 20 times cheaper launch to low earth orbit. I mean, we didn't need to be directed to do that. And I'm excited by the fact that our shops are savvy, they're data driven, and they understand the talent of their people. And we have, and you know, people want to come to the United States. They want to come legally. They want to come illegally. They want to come to the United States. And that's because we have a wonderful quality of life. We have a wonderful quality of life. We have a wonderful quality of life because our airplanes fly, our cars go, the brakes work, the airbag deploys if you weren't paying attention, and we make great bone screws if we need to reassemble. Okay? And we do that in manufacturing, and in particular, in precision manufacturing. So I'm a fan. I'm happy my son's working in it. I'm ha I would be happy if my daughters were working in it. They're not, but they've got a place. And that's the real thing is precision ma machining is a place where everyone can bring their talent, their motivation, their positive attitude, and, and they'll find something to do that creates value. I mean, Manufacturing is the fourth largest segment of our economy, right? Manufacturing created 11% of U.S. GDP. We're only 8.6%. We're punching above our weight class. So yeah. it's exciting times. It's the cool thing that I see with precision machining is it's really, it's where innovation begins, right? For a lot of companies, R&D starts with, hey, can you make this part? Can you make this component? And it's the precision machining companies that are going back and telling Tesla, yeah, we could do it. It's possible. And so that's what's, yeah. Absolutely. So manufacturing is responsible for 70% of US R&D spending. Yeah. Manufacturing. Now, we're a segment of that. But 70% of R&D is being done by manufacturers. The rest of this economy needs to step up. Absolutely. I said we were going to come to a close, but now I've got to pick your brain. I'm really curious, you know, the CHIPS Act, which, which recently passed, and we've seen this investment now from some of the chips manufacturers in the U.S. and expanding. I think one of the chips manufacturers just said they're going to spend $40 billion on building out factories. I believe it's in Arizona. Arizona. Uh, what are your thoughts on the CHIPS Act? Do you think government should be more involved in making it easier and more it's supporting manufacturing in the U.S.? Well, I think government does have a way to support manufacturing, and that's get out of the way. The tariffs on steel and aluminum make no sense. They're not being paid by China. They're not being paid by foreign countries. They're being paid by U.S. consumers. And the way the aluminum markets are structured, the, next, the pricing is based on the next available ton. And so all the aluminum cans that get recycled they still, even though they're recycled here in the U.S. and re remelted and reported and made into new product, the tariff is applied to that aluminum because the way the pricing structure is in the aluminum markets. 
we have no need for those tariffs. Uh, should the government pick winners and losers? I don't think so. But here's what I do think. We don't live in a world where everything's easy. And we don't live in a world where everyone wants fair to be fair. Everybody wants fair to be fair for them. And in a world where we're all increasingly, increasingly reliant on high technology, our government does have a job to make sure that we don't fall behind. And so if there are incentives that can help us maintain leadership, we, you know, I think it was Western Electric that invented transistors. You know, we've kind of led in this space for a while. And so I think it's great that our government has come to the realization that the next competition, nation to nation, is in this technology space and get out of our way. And, you know, do I think putting $40 billion into a, a wafer plant, a foundry in Arizona makes sense? I, the question I would ask as an engineer is, tell me about the fresh water supply. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so... You know, I don't know. I don't have an opinion on whether that's a good decision or a bad decision, but I'm glad we're finally paying attention to the fact that our success as Americans, our continuation of our quality of life relies on high technology, relies on precision components, and help us, help us to continue to deliver and will deliver. That really just speaks to the point that precision machining is more important than ever, especially with the, Michael and I have been talking about the renaissance, manufacturing renaissance that's going on. So it's exciting to, to hear some of this growth that you've shared with us today. And sounds like a lot of the member companies are operating really strong and got bright futures ahead of them. It is. And you say renaissance, and that really reminds me for the longest time, young people's activities it was about the games. It was about watching the television or whatever. Now there are so many young people with additive manufacturing machines in their, in their yes. home, in the basement. They're, you know, they're makers. There's a movement of makers. I was at a recent committee meeting and they're talking about how they're trying to use this Arduino to make this or make that. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I remember helping my dad make a CB radio when I was in sixth grade. Well. It's taken a while, but now these, these, these young people are using their talent to make cool stuff for today. So the renaissance is barely beginning. Well, yeah. Miles, thank you so much for, for coming on and joining us today on the, the podcast. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, I loved, loved your insights. I love your passion and your intensity. <laughs> I can tell you care deeply about this space. It really comes through. So thank you for that, too. I mean, without precision manufacturing, we'd be huddled around a fire somewhere. <laughs> we'd be huddled under a fire and we'd be fighting bears for shell. That's not quality of life. We'll do All right. close with that image. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us on another episode of the Voices of Manufacturing podcast with Brian Salee and Michael Mullenberg. This show is brought to you by Dazuki, the premier digital transformation solution that allows manufacturers to standardize operations. Our website, where you can listen to our episodes and find tons of helpful resources, is dazuki.com. Sign up for our monthly newsletter so you'll be the first to know about new episodes. That's dazuki.com, and join us in creating the front line of the future.